welcome to our June lecture as part of our lecture series. My name is Robert Muscat. I'm the president of the Military Tissue Society of New South Wales. Just a bit of a plug, if you are not a member and you'd like to join, you can join today. We have the facilities to help you do that. Uh, so something to think about. Uh, we put our monthly lectures the first Saturday of each month. Uh, we had a great excursion last Sunday. We try to do that at least twice a year. Uh, we had up to 30 of our members and non-members attend the Lancer Barracks at Parramatta um, and had a few rides on their uh, armour. So uh, we were hoping to uh, organise another lecture, uh, sorry, an excursion in November later this year. Um, so again, welcome to our June lecture. Uh, and May this year marked the bicentenary of the Supreme Court of New South Wales and the proclamation of the Third Charter of Justice. Uh, and under the First Charter of Justice of 1788, the military played a central role in the administration of justice in New South Wales. And today, we have our privilege of having our patron, uh, the Major General Honorary Paul Brereton AM, who will be speaking to us on this topic. Paul joined the Reserves in 1975 and infantry in 1979. He served as second in command of the Sydney University Regiment uh, in the mid 90s, commanding officer of 4th, 3rd Battalion, Royal New South Wales Regiment in the late 90s, Chief of Staff, 5th Brigade, early 2000s, and Assistant Chief of Staff, Land, uh, Land Headquarters in the mid 2000s, and the Commander of 5th Brigade in the late 2000s. Uh, from 2011 to 13, he was Head of, head of Cadet, Reserve and Employer Support Division. He holds honorary appointments as Colonel Commandant of the Royal New South Wales Regiment and the University of New South Wales Regiment. More recently, uh, he was appointed the first Commissioner of the Federal National Anti-Corruption Commission. We put our hands together and welcome Major General Andrew Paul. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for coming along to listen. The topic might be a little esoteric, but it's one that's a bit close to my heart, and as I think you've probably gathered, I like on these occasions to use the opportunity of the patron's address generally to address large and enduring themes rather than too much individual detail, and that's what I plan to do this morning. A fortnight ago, on the 17th of May, an impressive ceremony was held An impressive ceremony was held just down the other end of Hyde Park in the so-called new Supreme Court building, the 1970s building in Banco Court there, to mark the bicentenary of the Supreme Court of New South Wales and the proclamation of the Third Charter of Justice. The Third Charter brought to an end an era in which the military had a prominent role in the administration of justice. Mm. As you've heard, under the First Charter of 1788, the first judicial officer in the colony was not a lawyer, but an army officer, the Deputy Judge Advocate, Captain David Collins. So the first part of my lecture today draws on the story of his life and work as told by the late Honourable John Nagel, himself a distinguished judge of the Supreme Court of New South Wales, who had during the Second World War served as a commando officer. In his work called Collins, the Courts and the Colony, published in 1996. And I do that to describe the role of the military in our early legal history. Now that changed pretty radically from 1824, but a significant relationship between the court and the armed forces continued and continues
used today. The Court's bicentennial history, constant guardian, changing times, the Supreme Court of New South Wales, 1824, 1824 to 2024, by Keith Mason, former President of the Court of Appeal, contains a chapter by Tony Kinane, who is here today, which relates the story of the changing nexus between the court and the services over that period. And in the second part of this lecture, I draw heavily on Tony's work to describe that evolving but enduring relationship in which the profession of law and the profession of arms are the same. Within a fortnight of landing at Sydney Cove, on the 7th of February, 1788, Captain Arthur Phillip assembled in a ceremonial parade the convicts and their guards and the few free settlers that accompanied them <coughs> and proclaimed three legal instruments. The first was his commission as Governor and Captain General. The second was the Legislative Act that established the colony. And the third was Letters Patent of 1787 commonly called the First Charter of Justice, constituting courts of justice for the infant colony. These courts were quite unusual, even by the standards of the times, and we shall describe them shortly. But at the fulcrum of the administration of justice in the infant colony sat the colony's legal officer, called the Deputy Judge Advocate. The person appointed to discharge those functions, the first Deputy Judge Advocate was not a lawyer, but a soldier, Captain David Collins of the Royal Marines. Born in London in 1756, he was the eldest son of Arthur Tooker Collins and Harriet Carolyn Fraser. His father rose to the rank of Major General and Commandant of Marines at Plymouth. At the age of 14, in 1770, young David was appointed an ensign in the Marines. In 1772, he was in charge of a party of Marines sent to rescue George III's sister, Princess Matilda, who was married to the King of Denmark, but had formed a liaison with the court physician, which appears to have riled the Danish somewhat. In 1775, he served in North America in the British attempt to suppress the American colonists' quest for independence. He was specially commended for his part in the Battle of Bunker Hill on the 17th of June, 1775. Returning from the war to England in 1777, he married Maria Proctor, the daughter of a prosperous Halifax merchant, and was appointed acting adjutant of Marines at Chatham. In 1781, he was serving on HMS Courageous and was in action when the Challenge Squadron under Lord Howe relieved Gibraltar. On the 1st of September 1783, two days before the Peace of Versailles between Britain, the United States, France, and Spain, he was placed on half pay as a captain and semi retired quietly to live with his wife at Rochester. This somewhat dull and difficult existence was terminated by his appointment as Deputy Judge Advocate for New South Wales. The commission by which he was appointed, or to use the words of the commission, by which he was constituted and appointed to be Deputy Judge Advocate in the settlement within our territory called New South Wales, was most unusual, at least to a judge of today. It commanded him carefully and diligently to discharge the duty of Deputy Judge Advocate by doing and performing all and all manner of things thereunto belonging. And you are to observe and follow such orders and directions from time to time as you shall receive from our Governor of our said territory for the time being, or any other your superior officer, according to the rules and discipline of law. The conjunction of acting as a judicial officer and obeying a superior officer according to the rules and discipline of law would not sit well today. The things belonging thereunto included presiding over the Court of Criminal Jurisdiction and the Court of Civil Jurisdiction. Indeed, the role has been described as probably unique in history. He 
received the complaints, drew up the indictments, decided if there was sufficient evidence for a trial, then presided over the trial, conducted the prosecution, ruled on the evidence, voted on guilt or innocence, and sentence. That probably slightly overstates how it worked in practice, as we'll see from a later account. To perform these manifold functions, not only was he not a lawyer, but he didn't have any legal assistance. There was no other lawyer available to him for assistance or advice. For the law, he would have to rely on such experience as he had from courts martial and a small selection of law books that were sent out with the first point. Under the first charter, serial criminal offences were to be tried by the Court of Criminal Jurisdiction. It was constituted by the Deputy Judge Advocate, together with, quote, six officers of His Majesty's forces by sea or land, unquote. It was directed to apply English law as nearly as can be, considering and allowing for the circumstances and situation of the place of administration of foresaid and its inhabitants. However, it was authorised to act to proceed in a more summary way than in a court of criminal jurisdiction in England. It was to decide guilt or innocence on a vote of all seven of its members and then sentence, and the sentence could be death or corporal punishment. In effect, it was a military jury of seven. However, concurrence of five, or of at least five, was required in a capital case. Captain Watkins Tench, one of the company commanders of the three companies of the Royal Marines that accompanied the First Fleet, in his journal, described the court very nicely as follows. As the constitution of this court is altogether new in the British annals, I hope my reader will not think me prolix in the description I'm about to give of it. The number of members, including the Judge Advocate, is limited by Act of Parliament to seven, who were expressly ordered to be officers either of His Majesty's Sea or Land Forces. The court being met, completely arrayed and armed as at a military tribunal, the Judge Advocate proceeds to administer the usual oath taken by jurymen in England to each member, one of whom afterwards swears him in a like manner. This ceremony being adjusted, the crime laid to the prisoner's charge is read to him and the question of guilty or not guilty put. No law officer on the side of the Crown being appointed, for I presume the head of the court ought hardly to consider himself in that light, notwithstanding the title he bears, to prosecute the criminal is left entirely to the party at whose suit he is tried. All the witnesses are examined on oath and the decision is directed to be given according to the laws of England, or as nearly as may be allowing for the circumstances and situation of the settlement, by a majority of votes, beginning with the youngest member and ending with the president of the court. In cases, however, of a capital nature, no verdict can be given unless five at least of the seven members present concur therein. The evidence on both sides being finished and the prisoner's defence heard, the court is cleared and upon the judgment being settled, is thrown open again and sentence pronounced. During the time the court sits, the place in which it is assembled is directed to be surrounded by a guard under arms and admission to everyone who may choose to enter it granted. By comparing it with the mode of administering justice in the English courts of law, it will be found to differ in many points very essential. And if we turn our eyes to the usage of military tribunals, it no less departs from the customs observed in them. Some of the officers of His Majesty's forces by land or sea took the view that it was no part of their duty to serve on the court. Lieutenant Radcliffe Clark <coughs> remarkably complained in July 1788 that their duties were, quote, much harder than any officer had in the British Army in time of war. The worst duty is sitting as members of the criminal court. I hope that I never will sit again, for I would rather be on guard for a month than to sit on the trials of these poor wretches. Later, one officer, Captain Campbell, whose name is perpetuated in Campbell's Cove, refused 
refused to be rostered, leading to an unseemly argument with Governor Phillip. By the time Phillip's position was vindicated by the colonial officer, by the colonial office, Campbell had long since left the colony. In addition to the criminal court just described, the Deputy Judge Advocate sat every week, usually on a Saturday, with several people who the Governor had appointed as Justices of the Peace, as a bench of magistrates, to deal on a summary basis with minor criminal infractions of Governor's regulations, such as drunkenness, disorderly conduct in public, and disobedience. The bench of magistrates could also arrest, grant bail, and take depositions in serious criminal matters to be committed for trial to the Court of Criminal Jurisdiction. They also perform miscellaneous administrative functions such as issuing licences and setting the price of bread. Collins presided over the bench of magistrates as he did over the more senior court of criminal jurisdiction. The functions and the range of legal and administrative functions performed by this non-legally qualified officer was therefore quite considerable. And it extended to the Court of Civil Jurisdiction, which under the latest patent was constituted by the Deputy Judge Advocate and two fit and proper persons inhabiting the said place to be appointed from time to time by the Governor. The quorum would be constituted by two, but one of them had to be the Deputy Judge Advocate. This court was given full power and authority to hold plea and hear and determine in a summary way all pleas concerning lands, houses, tenements and hereditaments, and all manner of interests therein, and all pleas of debt, account and other contracts, trespasses, and all manner of other personal pleas whatsoever. It was directed to give judgment according to justice and right, whereas normally we are sworn to do justice according to law. It also had jurisdiction to make grants of probate. An appeal from its judgment lay to the Governor, and if the subject matter exceeded £300 to the Privy Council. <coughs> in his work, Collins sets out and reviews extensively the very many cases over which Nagel sets out and reviews comprehensively the very many cases over which Collins presided between February 1788 and his departure from the colony in 1796. It is beyond the scope of this lecture to descend into that detail and do that, so I turn to the contemporaneous appreciations of Collins at the end of his service. He presided over the new judicial architecture in New South Wales for a period of eight years, also serving throughout that period as private secretary to the successive governors. He left the colony in 1796. Although he had been granted permission to leave significantly earlier, he did not do so ostensibly because no suitable replacement for him had been identified, but possibly on account of his liaison with the convict woman Anne Yates, with whom he had two children in 1790 and 1793. He left the colony in September 1976, arriving in England nine months later in mid-1797. Mid he published an account of the English colony in New South Wales in two volumes, the first in 1798 and the second in 1802, which was dedicated to Lord Hobart, which has some later significance. Each and every governor he had served was high in their praise of Collins, even though he might sometimes have disagreed with their orders, which he had to see enforced. <coughs> Philip wrote, I feel myself bound in justice to say that I have seen no cause ever to be dissatisfied with his conduct. On the contrary, I have always found him ready to exert himself for the public good. Hunter said, in his departure from hence, the colony loses a most valuable and excellent officer. You cannot conceive, sir, how much this settlement will suffer in the Department of the Law by this gentleman's return home.
retrospective appraisals are, as you might expect from 20th century lawyers, less flattering, but still kind. Ray Ellis Mitchell, a former a late judge of the Supreme Court of New South Wales and an historian, and John Bennett, the historian of the Supreme Court of New South Wales, who wrote the sesquicentenary history of that court 50 years ago, together wrote that, though not a lawyer, Collins discharged his duties competently and conscientiously, that he did his best in the face of the difficulties arising from his conflicting roles as prosecutor, judge, and general advisor. Jeff Woods, criminal law academic, barrister, and judge of the District Court of New South Wales, in his History of the Criminal Law in New South Wales, wrote, although his position was impossible, his record seems to show that he generally did his best to act fairly and lawfully. The admirable principle of acting on the basis of evidence rather than on the basis of rumour, religion, or mere prejudgment can be identified from the early work of the colony's criminal courts, though one does not need to look far to see the bloodthirsty features of the system. Nagel describes him as a decent officer with a sense of fairness and social responsibility, though that is not always a substitute for legal principle. In the great majority of cases, he acted wisely, though not always with a solution which was legally correct or even logical but rough and ready justice was achieved which fitted the situation. But he failed noticeably at times, particularly when his prejudice in favour of the authority which his commission bound him to obey resulted in what we would regard as travesties. But as Nagel points out, he was not appointed as a judge, he was a soldier acting as a judge. Collins' own summation is to be found at the conclusion of the second volume of his account. Having by my services there in New South Wales been precluded from succeeding to my proper situation in the professional line to which, it was bred, to which I was bred, presumably as a soldier, without any other reward as yet to boast of than the consciousness of having ever been a faithful and zealous servant to my employers, and knowing that the particular hardship of my case has been acknowledged by every gentleman in and out of office to whom it has been communicated. He was, in his own words, a faithful and zealous servant. On his return to England, his application to resume half pay was refused. He was told that if he was to return to the Marines, it would be his youngest captain. He was receiving a remuneration of five shillings a day. Things seem to have improved somewhat with the publication of the account. He sought the patronage of various potentates without initial success. The following publication in 1802 of the second volume of the account dedicated to Lord Hobart. Remarkably, in 1803, Hobart appointed Lieutenant Colonel Collins of the Royal Marines to be Lieutenant Governor of the new settlement to be established at Port Phillip. Collins arrived at Port Phillip in October 1803, but, like many from this state, didn't like the site, and requested permission to relocate to Van Diemen's land. Governor King approved. And so it was Collins who established the new colony at Hobart, where he remained in charge as Lieutenant Governor until his death on the 24th of March, 1810. Although there seem to have been significant deficiencies in his administration from a prudential and accounting point of view, he appears to have been highly regarded by the settlers, free and convict, for his humanity. There, as he had in New South Wales, he found solace in a relationship, this time with one Margaret Ed Eddington, the wife of a convict named Powers, with whom he had two children, born in 1808 and 1809. Mr. Powers was well compensated with a free pardon and a land grant. <laughs> this so scandalised Governor Bly that even he would not stay at Collins' government house in Hobart when he fled from Sydney at the time of the rebellion. Collins fares pretty well 
in comparison to his successors prior to the Third Charter. They were not soldiers and some of them were lawyers. Richard Atkins acted as Deputy Judge Advocate after Collins' departure between 1796 and 1798 when the ineffectual Richard Dorr assumed office and Atkins was permanently appointed after Dorr's death on the 18th of December 1800, occupying the position until he was displaced in the Rum Rebellion in 1808. He was reappointed during the rebel administration until Macquarie's arrival on the 2nd of December 1809. Coupling a serious drinking problem with the power of life and death over his fellows was always going to be problematic. It was said that he often failed to separate his drinking from his judging, and he was regarded by many of his contemporaries as incompetent and brutal. When Macquarie arrived, there began the era of the unfortunately named for judges, Bent Braves. Macquarie was accompanied by Ellis Bent, a barrister, as the new deputy judge advocate. Then, under the Second Charter of 1814, the original civil court constituted by the Deputy Judge Advocate and two fit and proper persons was superseded <coughs> by the first so-called Supreme Court to be presided over by a judge with two magistrates. There was no change to the arrangements in the criminal jurisdiction. But in an arrangement which today might raise the interests of an anti-corruption commission, <laughs> Bent persuaded Macquarie to have his elder brother Geoffrey Bent sent as the first judge of the new civil Supreme Court. Of Geoffrey Bent, Chief Justice Murray Gleeson said at the 175th anniversary of the Third Charter that he was not only the first but also the worst judge in the colony. When Ellis Bent died on the 11th of November 1815, he was succeeded as Deputy Judge Advocate by John Wilde a man of immense religiosity, highly enthusiastic about the benefits of Bible reading as a cure for criminality, a powerful advocate of a solitary confinement and of the death penalty. Between 1819 and 1824, 95 people in the then very small colony of New South Wales were executed while he was deputy judge advocate. That's more than one a month. Things changed come the 17th of May 1824 when the third charter creating today's Supreme Court with criminal and civil jurisdiction was proclaimed. That brought to an end the era in which criminal law in the colony was the province of the military. The first Chief Justice, Sir Francis Forbes, clashed with the military governor, Gitarlan, to establish civil supremacy. But the next era in relations between the court and the armed forces really begins with Sir Alfred Stevens' 29 years as Chief Justice, which coincided with many inauspicious imperial adventures. The retreat from Kabul in 1842, the Crimean War of 1853 to 1856, and the Indian Mutiny of 1857. All these were vividly reported with unrestrained outrage in the local press, with the image of besieged Britishers surrounded by savages becoming a central element of the imperial narrative. <coughs> Chief Justice Stephen, whose cousin served with the British Army during the Indian Mutiny and saw action at Cornwall and the relief of Lucknow, and who had another relative in the Crimean War, conspicuously donated to the Indian Mutiny Relief Fund, as did Justice Terry. This set a precedent Overt judicial support of such funds would continue well into the second, into the 20th century. Also in his role as Lieutenant Governor, <coughs> Chief Justice often visited military establishments, participated in military ceremonies and met veterans. This too would continue. On another front, in the second half of the 19th century, New South Wales began to develop its own military forces. The last British soldier was to leave in the 1870s. This reinvigorated the movement to create a domestic volunteer reserve. One of the chief proponents of that scheme was one William Charles Windia, who was appointed to the bench of the court in 1879. 
In 1860, he had been the main mover, thank you, in the revival of the volunteer forces. He was commissioned captain of the second company of the Sydney Battalion, and in 1968, promoted major. The Windias have been prominent in the military and the judiciary ever since. In 1873, Alfred Stephen was succeeded as Chief Justice by the Irish-born, Australian-educated Sir James Martin, who'd previously been Premier and whose name is perpetuated by Martin Place. When General Gordon was besieged in Khartoum, New South Wales offered to provide a contingent. On Saturday the 21st of February 1885, some 12,000 residents gathered at the then exhibition building in Prince Alfred Park near Central Railway. Lending legal gravitas to the proceedings was the Chief Justice, who, disregarding more cautious counsel from his colleagues, proposed a motion that this meeting endorses the prompt and patriotic action of the government of this colony in placing at the disposal of the Imperial Government a contingent of troops for service in Egypt and accords its hearty approval of the same. Martin made an impassioned speech stating that there should be a patriotic part to support the troops and that his duty overrode any accusations of political partiality that may be levelled against him. Thousands of pounds were subscribed. This too set precedent, as we shall see. Although some, including Sir Henry Parks, demeaned the campaign, it has significance as the first deployment by Australian troops and it would ultimately earn for my regiment the Battle on the Suat in 1885. Its veterans were accorded considerable respect within the court, with one imposing court orderly of 35 years described as a formidable presence. Standing straight as a poplar tree, with chest adorned with three medals, the Indian Mutiny with clasp, the Sudan Medal, and the Khadiv Star, bronze, Alfred Tate, orderly of the Supreme Court of New South Wales, never fails to attract attention. Veterans became a respected part of the fabric of the court. This too continued well into the second half of the 20th century. There are still elements of it today. After the Sudan, the next great imperial cause was the Boer War in South Africa. Like his predecessor, Chief Justice Darby, who had succeeded Martin in November 1886, spoke in public about the war, expressing his great interest. He was one of a number of passionate judicial supporters of various patriotic funds established for the support of the troops in South Africa. After the war, Darby was appointed to conduct a Royal Commission on the Boer War in Africa, to inquire into the military preparations, the supply of men, ammunition, equipment, and the military operations up to the occupation of Pretoria. His report, published in 1903, uncovered deficiencies in virtually every aspect of the enterprise. This appointment was an early example of the use of judicial officers to undertake commissions of inquiry into military affairs. 
In the early decades of the 20th century, mention of the Boer War resonated throughout the discourse of the courtroom. If a party or a witness was a veteran of South Africa, the opportunity to point that out was not to be lost. These recurring references reflected the regard in which those who had served were held and the place that service was seen to hold in the national character. When the drums of war sounded again in 1914, Chief Justice Darley had been succeeded in 1910 by the first locally born and educated Chief Justice, the Honourable Sir William Trump. <coughs> On the evening of the 5th of August 1914, only hours after war was declared, in scenes reminiscent of the earlier campaigns, at Sydney Town Hall, on the occasion of the New South Wales State Governor Sir Gerald Strickland's banquet for the judges of the High Court of Australia, then no doubt during their, during their peregrination around the colonies or the states, the Supreme Court of New South Wales and other leading citizens, the normally restrained evening was transformed with passionate patriotic fervor. <laughs> The speeches were punctuated by cheers and patriotic outbursts, displaying an ebullient energy not usually expected when judicial officers gathered. Strickland spoke to a constant chorus of cheers as he compared the scene in Sydney with the mood in Brussels shortly before the victory at Waterloo. The evening presaged a continuum of public activity by judges throughout the war. Exactly a year later, at a rowdy pack meeting at Sydney Town Hall on the 5th of August 1915, commemorating the anniversary of the outbreak of the war, a speech by Chief Justice Cullen was cheered to the echo. He invoked the manner in which Germany had shown no scruple in trampling underfoot international law, which therefore made this a righteous war. At one stage he was overcome with emotion and unable to continue. The crowd called on him to cheer up. This evening marked a high point of judicial support for Australia at war. During the war, court sittings could be interrupted for a service for fallen soldiers. The first of these was convened by Chief Justice Cullen as early as the 5th of May 1915 for the popular and promising barrister, Colonel Henry Norman McCorrick who had been killed in action in the first days of the Gallipoli campaign by a sniper. He was the commander of the 1st Brigade and had gone forward to observe the positions. Cullen was a credible advocate and his emotion is understandable on both counts because his sons were serving on Gallipoli. He was not the only one. In 1917, one newspaper reported that in proportion to numbers, no trade or profession in Australia has suffered more bereavement in the war than have the judges in the higher tribunals. Six out of the eight Supreme Court judges over the period 1914 to 18 had sons who enlisted. In all, 12 out of 16 eligible sons joined up. Nearly all of them saw action, most were wounded, three were killed. The other two judges didn't have sons to enlist. That didn't stop their families assisting in other ways. It's worth mentioning in particular the family of Justice Philip Whistler Street, then the judge on bankruptcy and probate, and later the Chief Justice. All three of his sons enlisted. Young Lawrence Whistler Street was killed at Gallipoli on the 19th of May. Kenneth Whistler Street was precluded by injury from frontline service, but worked on the staff of internment camps and then in a variety of staff positions. In the 1950s, he would in turn be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Their cousin Jeffrey Street received the Military Cross. Two other close relatives lost their lives. And despite all that, their youngest son, Ernest Street, was permitted to enlist and followed his brothers and cousins to war and was wounded in action in October 1918. 
Justice Archibald Simpson's Chief Judge in Equity lost one son, George, of lone crime. His other son survived. Justice David Ferguson was sitting in Darlinghurst on the 27th of June 1916 when he was interrupted to be told that his son Arthur had been killed in action in France. His other sons, Keith, was sailing, sailing over to join his brother. He could have been kept from the front line, but his father insisted that there be no intervention. Later, Keith was severely wounded in action himself. He survived the war, but had a long period of convalescence. In time, he too would become a judge of the court. Justice Pring's son, Philip, enlisted in the field artillery in November 1916, and his second son, Sidney, in early 1917, he sailed to the front at the end of the year and was wounded but survived the war. Harold Snellen QC, a later Solicitor General, wrote that like those who had fought in the Boer War, the lawyers who joined up were inspired by a mixture of patriotism, daring, and elements of chivalry and pilgrimage that had characterised the Crusades. To which we would add an all-pervading sense of social obligation and shared values of duty, service, and loyalty. The judges and their families also supported the war effort through involvement in charities. Justice Ferguson gave energetic leadership to the 20th Battalion's Comforts Fund and was an official visitor to internment camps to protect the rights of those interned as enemy aliens. Another judge who acted as an official visitor was Justice John Musgrave Harvey. In 1918, he headed an inquiry into the internment of the, under the War Precautions Regulations Act of seven men of Irish descent, trying to elicit support for the Irish Republican movement. He found that the phase of the movement with which they were concerned involved collaboration with German interests against those of the Empire. The judicial community's activity extended to their families. Justice Sly had no sons to enlist, but his wife Constance was a foundation member of the executive of the State Division of the British Red Cross Society. The Chief Justice's wife, Lady Libby Cullen, was a leading figure in the New South Wales Red Cross. In 1917, she initiated the exhortation, Carry On, which became the motto for the Red Cross in the latter years of the war. The active role of women such as her was instrumental in the passage of the Women's Legal Status Act in 1918, giving women the right to become lawyers and members of parliament. Justice Simpson's wife was also active in the Red Cross and the War Chest Committee, which sent comforts to her deceased son's unit, the Sydney-based 4th Battalion, the lineage of which is now borne by the 4th 3rd Battalion of my regiment. Judicial decisions during the war tended to favour the war effort. There were a number of high-profile war-related cases engaging the court. The most prominent was the trial of the International Workers of the World before Mr Justice Prim at a time when his sons were serving abroad. Eventually, after much agitation, the International Workers of the World were released or the martyrs, as they were called, were released after a review by a judge from Tasmania in 1920. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's probably my problem. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think that's probably my problem. Chief Justice Cullen held that strikes were unlawful acts under the War Precautions Act. 25 years later, things had changed significantly. 
On the outbreak of the Second World War, Sir Frederick Jordan succeeded Sir Philip Street as Chief Justice. He was more discreet and some would say judicial than his predecessors in his support. Whereas under Cullen, judicial decisions invariably favoured the war effort, Jordan struck down as unlawful many regulations made under the National Security Act of 1939, which imposed wide-ranging restrictions on the activities of citizens. Indeed, in the words of his biographer, he made life hell for the federal government. A personal reminisce from the time by his former associate, John Slattery, who himself would later be a judge of the Supreme Court, described the business of the war in the of the court in the war years this way. In the 1940s, a considerable amount of court time was expended in appeals by way of the prerogative writs, prohibition, mandamus, certiorari, and statutory prohibition, mainly involving the national security regulations. In many of his judgments, Sir Frederick dealt severely with them. I think of his judgments concerning Commonwealth delegated legislation through the national security regulations resulted solely from his interpretation of these regulations. His strict requirement for regulations to be drafted with complete clarity and precision, especially in cases affecting the civil rights and liberties of the individual. In argument, it was clear that he was strongly opposed to sloppy and imprecise drafting. It must have been painful for him as an Australian judge to make such adverse decisions at a time when Japanese forces were carrying the war to the Australian mainland. In my view, he made his decisions on his conscientious interpretation of the law, irrespective of whether they were made in peace or in wartime. Nothing he said, either privately or in the course of argument in court, indicated he was moved by any other doctrines. To him, the rule of law and due process were not suspended during a war. No doubt, if the said regulations had been drafted without ambiguity and with lucidity, he would have upheld them. There was, however, one matter in which Jordan did uphold the authority of the federal government, rejecting a challenge to the internment of members of the Australia First Movement, a full court over which he presided, held that the Minister for the Army had supreme power over internments and the court had no jurisdiction to intervene. Extrajudicially, Jordan was a patron of the Sydney University Law School Comforts Fund, which maintained a legal profession's sense of community through newsletters, type, provision of type lecture notes and other lecture material sent to lawyers serving at the front and law students. And as Lieutenant Governor, he too greeted visiting American sailors, supported war-related fundraising events by groups such as the Royal Empire Society, and reviewed military parades. <coughs> Once again, other judges and their families also contributed. Justice Davidson was appointed chairman of an advisory committee to hear appeals by internees against the exercise of the national security regulations. He was also an official visitor to internment camps at Cowra, Hay, Orange and elsewhere. In 1945, he chaired a committee to arrange for refresher courses for legal act servicemen, an important role which enabled legal act servicemen to return to their practices after the war. His wife was president for much of the war. A retired judge, Reginald, Helpett, Reginald Heath Long Innes, who retired from the bench in 1939, served as chairman of the number one aliens tribunal, established in 1940, so that enemy aliens could submit objections to their internment, which would recommend their release if they were not deemed a threat. His only son, George, was killed in action near Kiel while serving with the RAF in Bomber Command in February 1942. Justice Leslie Heron, who would be Chief Justice during the 1960s, lost his younger brother Henry in Greece in June 1941. 
1942, Justice Roper was appointed a member of the Prime Minister's Committee of National Morale. Justice Owen, who as we've heard was a veteran of the First War, chaired the Central War Committee and was a member of the Australian delegation to a conference in London in 1945 on the disposal of wartime war stocks. In 1950, he chaired a committee to investigate claims for payment of an allowance to ex-prisoners of war. Other judges were also active supporters of the Sydney University Law School Comforts Fund. All this meant that for decades after both wars, the character of the Supreme Court of New South Wales was shaped by the military experience of the judges who constituted it. A particular feature of the collective judicial identity in the 20th century was the number of judges and court staff who were veterans. At least nine who had served in the first war were later appointed judges of the Supreme Court. The same followed the second war. At least 39 veterans of that war became judges of the court. Some of the first war veterans were still on the bench into the 1960s, providing an ongoing close personal connection between the veterans of the two great conflicts. Many of them maintained close links with their former units and other ex-service organisations, such as Sydney Legacy. War service may not have been a prerequisite for appointment to the bench in those years, but it was a common denominator for men. But in that, the court reflected the society in which it operated. The appointment of men from this background and experience shaped the character of the bench. Military experience provided a unifying bond amongst many of those who had served. They brought with them a range of life experience well beyond the normal curricula of law schools. Some had been wounded in action, nor was this confined to the judges themselves. Many court staff, particularly the judges' personal staff, were veterans. The effects varied among individuals, but it's unsurprising that they generally favoured values of duty and service and loyalty, and exhibited a marked sense of self-discipline. Many brought a noticeably military bearing to their courts, but gave them a formal, sometimes formidable manner. John Bryson, QC, a barrister who worked with many of them in the 1960s and later himself became judge of the Supreme Court, wrote that these veteran judges were at the ascendancy of their careers, distinguished for learning, powers of expression, and distinguished most for untroubled and well-based self-confidence <coughs> and fearlessness, which he attributed to the war service, to their war service, and the experience of survival. Although the passage of time has seen this influence wane, it has not entirely been lost. In more recent times, judges have often had experience in the reserve forces, usually in their legal capacity, but sometimes in the general service capacity. Judges have also, in marked distinction to the position 200 years ago, been in positions of influencing and shaping the way the military develops as opposed to the other way. Judges have served as Judge Advocates General and Deputy Judge Advocates General. In this role, they oversee the military justice system and bring the learning and standards of a superior court judge to the administration of military discipline. Judges of the court have also served as members of the Courts Martial's Appeals Tribunal later the Defence Force Discipline Appeals Tribunal. Established by the Court Martial's Appeals Act of 1955, this serves as a Court of Criminal Appeal for Courts Martial, and it established <coughs> ultimate, ultimate oversight by civilian lawyers of what was once an exclusively military activity. <coughs> Kep Enders, 
who would become Attorney General of the Whitlam Government and later a judge of the Supreme Court, observed that the tribunal's decisions were imposing on courts martial the standards of justice required by a court of criminal appeal in a proper criminal trial. The establishment of that tribunal reflects the reversal of the practical military control of the civilian courts 200 years earlier. Since Chief, Justice's Daly, since Chief Justice Daly's inquiry into the Boer War, of which we've spoken, judges of the Supreme Court have been appointed to a number of inquiries that have been loaded with military and social significance. We've already touched on some of those during and around the Second World War. In 1954, Justice Owen, First War veteran, was appointed as a Royal Commissioner to inquire into espionage by the Soviet Union in what is usually referred to as the Petrov Affair. His senior counsel assist assisting was Major General Sir Victor Windy at Queen's Council, later a judge of the High Court. The Commission featured clashes between an increasingly erratic Herbert Beer Effort QC, appearing for the Commonwealth, who was later appointed, uh, no, appearing for the Communist Party, who was later appointed Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of New South Wales. Owen's findings that there were espionage but that no one should be prosecuted was a delicate solution to the situation. Justice Ken Asprey was one of three judges appointed in 1967 to the Second Royal Commission into the sinking in 1964 of HMAS Voyager in a collision with HMAS Melbourne. The second commission exonerated Chaplain John Robertson. Counsel in that commission included the young Lawrence Whistler Street, the son of Sir Kenneth Street and grandson of Sir Philip Street. Lawrence Street had served in the Second World War in the Navy and used his experience in his cross-examination. <coughs> he too would later become Chief Justice of the Court in the 1970s. Justice Terry Cole was appointed to head an inquiry in March 2008 into the loss of the cruiser HMAS Sydney II in its battle with Cormoran during World War II. I've always thought that either as a judge or as counsel, that would have been a terrific inquiry to do. No living clients to <laughs> trouble you or convey. The total freedom to reign where you wanted to and go down as many rabbit holes as you wanted to without concern. And of course, there was also an inquiry into Afghanistan. And so, in the beginning, the administration of justice in New South Wales was in many ways dominated by military influence. Although the Third Charter, whose bicentenary we now celebrate, ended these arrangements, a strong connection between the Supreme Court and the armed forces endured, with each bearing an influence on the other. A common sense of duty and service and loyalty is one of the underlying themes. Until and including the Great War, overt judicial support for the services was not uncommon and probably unconsciously informed judicial decision making. But from the time of Sir Frederick Jordan, the approach was more discreet and judicial. The population of the bench by ex servicemen gave a distinctly military character to the court, whose judges were moulded by their service experience and who brought that experience and knowledge of humankind that comes with it to the bench. Though to a lesser extent, that continues to today through the reserve service experience of a number of judges. But in distinction to earlier times, judges now perform a number of roles in and around the military, through which they bring their legal learning and a degree of oversight to the services, and to the administration of military law, the rigours of judicial independence, method and standards. And so the relationship continues to mutual benefit, though the balance has significantly shifted. Thank you. 
the Navy at the time, the Naval Discipline Act, had morphed into the Defence Force Discipline Act, or that version of it. Um, I commanded ships and establishments, and I had extraordinary powers of summary punishment under the Naval Discipline Act. And I recall well the wrangling between the three services that finally brought about the Defence Force Discipline Act. I think at most I dismissed people, I sent people to military prison, I sent people to cells, or whatever. Mr. Mean to say. Anyway, I, I sensed 30 years after I had left the Defence Force that sailors, for example, at sea today, are probably more su subject to uh, interpretation of civil law rather than necessarily military law. Mm -hmm. I, I got that all wrong. I think slightly so. For this reason, the, if you look at the Defence Force Discipline Act of today, if you look at the offences to which soldiers, sailors, airmen are subject, they are almost identical to those that were in the old Naval Discipline Act and those that were in the Army Act a century ago, ranging from mutiny, desertion, assault on a subordinate, assault on a superior, to prejudicial behaviour, although the wording has changed slightly from conduct to the prejudice of good order and military discipline, all those offences are basically the same ones that have already been there, that have always been there. The procedures that you would be familiar with as a commanding officer of your time are the, the procedures are now less summary, uh, more protracted. There is, I venture to say, a degree more natural justice and procedural fairness involved than there might have been a hundred years ago. But an orderly room is not that radically different from what it once was. So I don't think the, that civilian law is really dominating the military law in its application to discipline of soldiers. And I, look, I, I say that in the position of someone who from the Discipline Appeals Tribunal has overseen that uh, for a period. So while there is certainly an intrusion of the civil influence, and while that's moderated the procedures to some extent, the uh, you know, a commanding officer can still send a soldier to jail for 28 days, yes, and 42 days on active service. And it, and it still happens. But you can't say march the guilty bastard in some way. Uh, that's, exact, that's exactly right. And that, that was a big change in 1984. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Step back. Paul, <clears throat> you've eloquently outlined the very deep and abiding links between the judiciary and the military and the legal profession, indeed, and the, uh, and the military. I'm wondering if you all feel able to comment as to whether or not that has been significantly declining in the last few years and in particular as a result of the far lesser role the university regiments that you were in uh, play now in the in the reserve. Look, I think I think there are some signs of that. I mean, the biggest factor in that is that you know, once we had a court with 40 ex-service judges on it over the period from, you know, say, 1950 <coughs> through to the 70s. And that was an enormous influence, and uh, that is there no longer. Uh, I do think that it is not as easy as it was once for you and me to balance legal careers with military careers. Partly that's because of the <coughs> uh, increased expectation of commitment to lengthy periods of training that is required of reserve soldiers, so that's made it more difficult for them to balance two careers. I am somewhat optimistic that that's been wound back a bit and that might become a bit easier. But I do agree that the, uh, the close nexus between the universities and the services that, for example, university regiments provided has been very much eroded by their current <coughs> that uh, they are not being 
use optimally to extract military capability from universities and that in the long term that could result in a decline in the mutual influence I've, I've spoken of. First one was loss of bayonets, loss of three bayonets at Sydney University Reference, but ah. yes. <laughs> uh, uh, wonderful presentation, thank you very much, Sarah. But just a, a sort of a, a general sort of comment about the law. I remember as a junior officer being told um, when I was studying with the FDA, okay, there's what's written down here, and then there's what you've got in here <laughs> and in here, yeah. especially. And that there's no substitute for that. And over the years, one of the things that I've always noticed about the law in particular is it, it seems to function best when you've got decent and honest and honourable men interpreting the law rather than trying to enumerate every little thief, which often gets people down rabbit holes and into trouble, and we've all seen some of the consequences of that. I just wonder if you'd like to comment no, on that. I, I totally agree. I, I think when you have pieces of legislation that are hundreds of pages long with many hundreds of sections, some sections and so on. Uh, you don't need that. You need principles-based legislation that people of good intent can then <coughs> interpret and apply. The problem is, when you make laws, you can't always assume that it's going to be a benign actor who's administering them. So you have to make the laws to cover the possibility that a road might be there one day. But I look, in, in principle, I totally agree uh, the articulation of clear basic principles and then their interpretation by people of uh, sufficient knowledge, experience and goodwill is, is when it works best. Well, we might just end it there. Oh, sorry, one more one. Last one, last one. Uh, I have three questions. <laughs> three questions. <laughs> well, but you can pick whatever you can. Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. It's a lot of information. Simple question. Uh, after all your work and study into this category, are you still uh, believe uh, we have justice? And, um, do, and second question is, do we have improvement from all day till now. And the last question is, it's a lot of information. What is the best way uh, we can follow, um, follow your information? What is the way we can follow after this? Okay, I'll try, to, I'll try to answer all three of them. I'll do the second one first. Are we better off now than we were 200 years ago? Absolutely yes. I mean, we, have a, we have an independent judiciary, and frankly, in this country, we have a really good independent judiciary. We don't have judges that are selected by the Republicans or the Democrats. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And look, there, you know, if you go down the ranks of judiciary, the United States is not that far ranked below us, but we've got a, I think, a really independent judiciary. I have never heard in this country of a judge being approached uh, with a bribe or something like that. I've never come across an attempt by a government to pressure a judge in a particular direction. So I think in this day and age, we are in a really good position, as, even when you compare us to some of our closest comparators. Uh, okay, the first question was, So have we improved? Oh, do we have justice now? Well, justice is an abstract concept, but again, I think in this country, uh, we have as good a system as you will find anywhere in terms of the administration of justice. 
It is human based, it is therefore fallible. There will also always be errors, but we also have review and appeal systems to correct those errors. So, in the short answer is as close as close as humanly possible, yes. As to further information, uh, I would suggest the two books that I had on the very first slide here. So if you're interested in the Commons era, then uh, Collins, the Courts and the Connolly by John Nagel. Whoops. And there's also Jeff Wood's book, A History of the Criminal Law in New South Wales. Um, so that, that would be a good overview of that part of what I've covered. And in terms of the ongoing uh, relationship between court and uh, services, Tony's chapter in the Supreme Court's Bicentennial History uh, is strongly recommended. And then there are a number of other articles which are available online, some by Tony, a couple by me, a couple by others, dealing with the relationship of the legal profession and the military more broadly, which you could also follow up. Thank you. All right, can I just uh, again thank Paul for being here. You can imagine uh, how busy Paul is. Uh, we are so privileged to have a patron. Oh, there's no corruption. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, when we contact Paul, when I make that first contact, at no stage he ever is reluctant to come and speak to us. And to have a patron of his status and his work life, to give it up and to come and join us uh, on a Sunday morning, can I just say we are so privileged. And uh, we, we really genuinely thank you for being here. So if we put our hands together.